What are you? Biology puts beyond doubt that you're an organism. Like all other organisms, humans metabolize and reproduce. You're an animal. Like all animals, you have to eat other organisms to survive. You're a mammal. Like all mammals, your body is covered in hair. You're a primate. Like all primates, you've got this immensely useful opposable thumb. And you're a hominid. Like all apes, you've lost your tail, and you've got a shoulder that allows you to rotate your arm 180 degrees. Yet, it would probably be prudent of me to call you an ape only from a safe distance. We'd like to think ourselves better than that, or at least vastly separate from other animals. Extraordinary. However, since Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, this notion has been under threat. Um, Darwin, of course, argued that we are descended from African apes. Today, there can be little doubt that he was correct. Genetic comparisons show that of all the creatures on the planet, the two species of chimpanzee have the closest DNA match to us. In fact, we are more closely related to chimpanzees than chimpanzees are related to the other African ape, the gorilla. So from a chimpanzee's perspective, we humans are their closest relative. This is not to say, of course, that we've descended from chimpanzees. Far from it. Chimpanzees could equally argue that they have descended from us. All that means is that over the last um, that we share a common ancestor that probably lived around six million years ago. Uh, both molecular evidence and fossil evidence point to this time of divergence. Gorillas split off some nine million years ago, or the line leading to gorillas, I should say, and the line leading ultimately to orangutans split off from this line some 14 million years ago. Now, Charles Darwin didn't have access to uh, molecular evidence of this sort, nor did he have access to a detailed fossil record. So he had to argue his case for human evolution entirely on evidence for continuity, for similarities between us and animals. Now, the um, things that remind us of our animal heritage often attract taboos. Birth, sex, defecation, urination, bleeding, sickness, dying, awful stuff. But even if we try to throw a veil over it, Darwin could point to all kinds of similarities in terms of anatomy, nervous system, vascular system, and so on and so forth. We are made of the same flesh and blood as other animals. Today we know we can take a pig's heart valve and put it in a human body and it works fine. So the physical continuity of the human body is incontestable. The mind, however, the mind is another matter. And it was a big problem for Darwin because there appears to be a vast gap separating humans from other animals in terms of mental capacities. Um, the human mind is extraordinary in many ways. We've been able to uh, control fire to invent the wheel. We ask ourselves questions like, what are we? Um, we uh, ultimately have sparked the civilizations that have changed the face of the earth, whereas our closest living relatives live unobtrusively in their remaining forests. So this was a real problem for Darwin. And Darwin hoped that psychology would come to the rescue eventually. He pred predicted that in the distant future, I see open fields for far more important researches. Psychology will be based on a new foundation that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Alas, he must have peeked into a very distant future indeed, because here we are over 150 years on, and psychology hasn't really been placed on a new foundation. In fact, these questions haven't been central to psychological inquiry at all. Nonetheless, there has been progress, in particular over the last few years, in us mapping more carefully the mental abilities of our closest relations. And I want to give you one example. And it's an example that really has something to do with this very question of who we are. And that is our ability to recognize our own reflection. Now, most of us start the day with a look in the mirror. Yet the other animals that are in our households, the cats and dogs and guinea pigs or what have you, uh, don't seem to react to mirrors in that same way at all. They certainly don't use mirrors to adjust their appearance in this way. Chimpanzees, however, do sometimes or at least they can be observed using reflective surfaces to examine parts of their body they can't otherwise see, such as their nether region. Gordon Gallop invented a really curious test that ultimately was very successful, in which he um, anesthetized chimpanzees, placed some rouge on the, over their brow, and then upon recovery presented them with a mirror. And indeed, the chimpanzees would use their mirror reflection to examine this part on their body that they could only see indirectly through the mirror. So they seem to recognize their own reflections just as we do. This 
task became immensely popular. And you don't have to anesthetize animals. You can just surreptitiously mark them. Same with children. You don't really want to anesthetize them to do this. So um, I've marked here this chimpanzee, Cassie, over the left brow. There's some white mark. Hopefully, you can make it out over there. And I present him with a mirror. And within a few seconds, the fingers go up, and he examines this novel mark on his face. So this task has a lot of face validity, if you don't mind me putting it that way. Um, and it has been used since with many, many different species. And heaps of different species consistently fail. Many different primates have been tested, and even after many hours of exposure to mirrors, consistently fail. Some of you might go like, hang on, I have heard something else, haven't I? Well, there have been reports of two dolphins passing the task, one elephant and two magpies. And they make headlines, these, these kind of... Uh, results. However, unfortunately, these studies have as yet not been replicated, so we need to treat them with a grain of salt. We do, however, have repeatedly replicated positive results from these creatures. Chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. So this raises the question of why do these creatures have this ability, or how did they evolve this ability? Well, there's two very distinct possibilities. One is that this is a result of convergent evolution. That is, each one of these genera independently evolved the trait at some point in history, and prehistory, I should say. So one of the gorilla's um, um, ancestors, a human one, a chimpanzee one, and an orangutan, at some point in the past evolved that trait independently. So we'd have to make four assumptions about events that have happened in the past. An alternative, more parsimonious, and therefore simpler explanation is this one. And that is to assume that the trait evolved in a common ancestor before orangutans split off the line of the other apes, uh, and presumably after the lines of the monkeys split off some 25 million years ago. Uh, and great apes have this ability because of common descent. Now this immediately raises the question about these guys there in the middle, the gibbons, or small apes, as they're sometimes called. There had only been three very small-scale studies on it, on Gibbon self-recognition, that is, and they only produced very ambivalent results. So Emma Collier-Baker and I recently conducted a study that um, wanted to examine this more carefully. We presented Gibbons with uh, icing sugar, which they love because it's very sweet. We then surreptitiously marked them on their arm or on their leg, and upon discovery of these marks, they all immediately groom themselves and take that sticker off, uh, that mark off, and eat it. So they're very much motivated to take a mark of their own body, if they can find it. Therefore, they should also be motivated to retrieve such a mark if they discover it while looking in a mirror. But when we conducted the mirror test, this is how they react. You see the gibbon there has a mark in the center of his face. The mirror is per perpendicular to the mesh. And now, see what happens. Most of observers have the impression that this gibbon is looking for the other gibbon. <laughs> and this is not unusual behavior. 15 of the 17 apes that we tested actually displayed this behavior of reaching or looking behind the mirror. So they don't seem to get it. But failure of that sort, of course, is difficult to interpret, like all negative results are. Uh, we don't know whether they fail for the reason that we're interested in or for some other reason. So we had to follow this up with various control conditions. I'm only going to bother you with one. Which, because I like it a lot. We, we took icing sugar and smeared it on the surface of the mirror itself while marking them with icing sugar on their face. All the gibbons would scrape off every last bit of icing on the surface of the mirror and yet entirely ignore the icing clearly visible in the mirror reflection, namely the icing on their own face. So at that point I thought, like, well, we really do have more than just absence of evidence here. This looks to me like evidence of absence. And for now at least I think it's fair enough to conclude that small apes do not have it which would then mean we could narrow down this time of emergence um, from the period that we had earlier described to this period here. The trait most likely evolved after the line ultimately leading to Gibbon split off from the line ultimately leading to the great apes. So between 18 and 14 million years ago, the trait evolved, and all the descendants of the creature that evolved this trait has this, have this trait uh, at present because of common descent. I love this stuff because it allows us to reason about the mind of an ancestor without even having to lay eyes on a fossil. We don't know what this creature looked like, but it probably knew what it looked like. <laughs> but this is not just for, for people interested in human evolution per se. This has practical implications as well. 
and qu rather important ones, I would hasten to say. If you think of this as a representation of everything about the human brain, the number of cells involved, the way it's wired, the endocrine system, you name it, then there are certain things about the human brain that we share with the chimpanzee brain. And there are certain things that are uniquely human, and there are certain things that no doubt are uniquely chimpanzee. The same must be true for gorillas and for orangutans. If it is the case that we share this trait because of common descent, it's a homology, then it's most likely that the neurological basis of the trait also is shared. In other words, when we want to find out the neurological basis of this higher cognitive trait, we should look at those traits that all great apes and humans share. The green bit there in the middle. And in fact, since we've just done this stuff with uh, lesser apes, with small apes, we can subtract everything about the brains of small apes that they share with the great apes from this equation. So we can narrow down the search space even more to the remnant uh, green spot over there. So we can make a real contribution there to neuroscience. The same logic, of course, applies with comparative genetics. If we want to find out the genetic basis of a particular trait, um, such as this one, we can again narrow down uh, the search for the critical bits to those things that all the great apes share and that we don't share with the small apes. So I think this is immensely useful. And of course, the approach itself is not limited to self-recognition. We can use that with other traits. Be that as it may, I think Charles Darwin would be extraordinarily happy with this kind of result because we're showing signs of continuity. Monkeys can't do it. Great apes can do it. Humans can do it. Continuity in the evolution of mind. This is not to say, of course, that our self-awareness is equivalent to the awareness uh, evident in other great apes. For instance, it might be the case that only humans can think about themselves in the remote past or in the remote future. Other people argue that humans are unique in terms of language, culture, morality. There are various things that uh, are potentially setting our minds still apart. And I won't have time to go into them in detail here. Suffice to say that the uniquely human traits most likely evolved over the last six million years, since the time that we split from the line leading ultimately to chimpanzees. This is not to say that the traits evolved in one quantum leap, nor that they evolved in a linear fashion up the ladder to Homo. Instead, there's a very bushy tree involving these fellows, our close relatives and um, ancestors, the hominids. And over the last six million years, there were many of them, and many more than people may realize. This is a, a illustration of a commonly recognized species and genera uh, of hominids over the last six million years. And may I draw your attention here to, say, 1.7 million years ago, a time when Homo erectus invented the most successful tool ever to be invented by any hominid, namely the bifacial hand axis. They were around for well over a million years. Um, at that time, Homo erectus shared the planet with other homos, with other Australopithecines, and with two species of Panthropus. All of them are upright walking, big brained, tool using hominids. Even very recently, say 2,000 generations ago, which may be equating to like 40,000 years ago, us, Homo sapiens, were sharing this planet with Neanderthals, with Homo floresiensis, which is um, sometimes known as the hobbits, with Denisovans, and quite likely with the last remnants of Homo erectus. So at that time, the difference, in, difference between humans and other creatures would have been very small in comparison to what it is now. You see, a gap, obviously, is defined by both its sides. It's not just a function of how smart or amazing or extraordinary we've become in ourselves. It depends on the comparative point. Who do we relate or compare this to? So a gap is defined by both its sides. And um, in a very real sense then, then, the gap between animals and humans is so large because the other hominins have gone extinct. So the question then is why? Why did they go extinct? Extinctions happen for many different reasons, and no doubt different hominids died out for different reasons. Typically, they have to do with uh, rapid environmental changes, like ice ages, and so on and so forth. But there's another culprit that in these instances I'd like us to consider, and that is ourselves, or better, our ancestors. We know from history that humans are capable of the most atrocious acts of genocide, warfare, and so on and so forth. Now, the only other creature that we know that cooperates to kill members of its own species is the common chimpanzee. So this trait might go back quite some distance. Uh, I hasten to say that we don't have direct evidence of any exterminations here, but it's quite likely that our ancestors had actually played a role in this. So they might have 
burned the bridges across the gap only to find themselves on the other side of the divide wondering how they got there. So in a real sense, one might argue that our exceedingly mysterious and unique status on Earth may be our own rather than God's creation. Now this raises, of course, also the question of what we're going to do about the future. Are we going to become even more extraordinary? It is possible. If you look at the last 100 years, IQ scores every 10 years have gone up about three points. Maybe we're getting smarter. It's undoubted the, the, the case that technologically we've had huge strides in terms of computer technology, biotechnology, and so on and so forth. So perhaps we're getting more extraordinary, much more different from other animals than we had been in the past. But there's another way in which we could become more special. And it's a simpler way and perhaps the more traditional way. And that is we could just exterminate all our closest living relatives. <laughs> Let's face it, we are in the process of doing exactly that. All apes are endangered or critically endangered, and they are in that situation for one reason, and one reason only, and that is human activity. Uh, the most common reason is, of course, habitat destruction, but often we go after them directly also, in terms of getting bushmeat or the pet trade. So um, the worst case at the moment, I believe, is the Heinen gibbon, of which there are only 23 individuals left. So our great-grandchildren might very well grow up in a world in which great apes are no more. And they might find that their closest animal relation is a monkey. Now, monkeys are very different creatures from apes. For starters, the people in the future might wonder what the importance is of having a tail, or not having a tail, for that matter. So I think uh, I would like to encourage us all to try to protect our um, tailless ape relatives while we still can. If we are able to achieve that, I believe that would be truly extraordinary. Thank you very much.